Good morning and happy Father's Day <laughs> to all of you. Um, let's just turn our attentions now to our Heavenly Father in worship. You can be seated or stand.
Lord be with our service this morning. Fill our pastor with your Holy Spirit as he brings us your word. May your will be done today and every day. We bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, I want to wish a happy Father's Day to all of my fellow dads out there. Uh, it is uh, a role that is often belittled and run down by the entertainment centers of our society. They like to make fun of dads, but dads have a very important and very special role. Thank you. Yep, I will not forget that. <coughs> dads have such an important <coughs> and special role. Oh, thank you, Lena. Um, I'm not sure where we're going to put it, but. <laughs> okay, that's perfect. Isn't that nice? Wow. Thank you, Lena. <laughs> it's just a nice splash of color, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, but fathers have such a special role. And we have a great role model in our Heavenly Father. And so uh, he's the one that all of us earthly fathers are supposed to be emulating. That's right. And so uh, there, there is a... There is a, uh, a gift that we would like to give to the fathers who are, are here today. There is a book. Uh, it's called Revealing Revelation. It's by a fellow named Amir Sarfati. And Amir is, um, he's got a great story. He was in the Israeli army. I think he was a major in the Israeli army. And he was our tour guide while we were going through Israel. And uh, God has just opened up a ministry to him in these last days, you know, uh, and, and so he, the, the book of Revelation is never far from his heart, and uh, so he wrote this book on the book of, it's about the book of Revelation, and the subtitle is How God's Plans for the Future Can Change Your Life Right Now. So, uh, you know, here we want to encourage fathers to be the spiritual leaders in their households, and to get excited about the things of the Lord and to, uh, you know, just to kind of just think about the fact that the Lord is coming back soon. We're going to talk about that more in the study. But so just we have that gift. So don't don't try to get away too fast after the service. We want to make sure that everybody that all the dads get a copy of that book. And then you can share it with all the people in your family, too, because it's uh, a great resource. Uh, I have started reading it myself. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but. It's, it's, a, it's a great blessing. So uh, I want to bring Michael up. And Michael is going to read Psalm 142. So if you want to follow along, he'll be in Psalm 142. You better turn there quick. It's pretty short. <laughs> Psalm 142. I cry out to the Lord with my voice. What? My voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path. In the way in which I walk, they have secretly set a snare for me. Look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. Very good. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. The, uh, the worship team, as normal, is going to play one more song. And as they do, if you would like to support the Lord's work here at Calvary Chapel Lemon Grove through your tithes and offerings, you can make use of the copy box in the hallway. And other than that, uh, God bless you. God bless you.
Greg, and thank you, Karen. As usual, you have beautified our service. <clears throat> As the worship team is getting settled, I wanted to tell you I, I heard a story of, of it's about a preacher who was getting ready for church one Sunday morning. And uh, he emerged from the bathroom and he had a large bandage on his face. And his wife asked him, what happened to you? And he said, well, I cut my face, you know, while I was shaming. I was concentrating on my sermon and I cut my face. And when he, his wife lovingly replied, you should have been concentrating on shaving while you were cutting your sermon. Oh. <laughs> so, so the um, uh, the uh, and the book of Jude actually presents us with just such a challenge because it's not that long a book really it's only got 25 verses in it a little over 600 words it's not a real long epistle is it and uh, in that in that chapter though in that short chapter, we're going to find eight illustrations from the Old Testament. And each one of those illustrations has some really fascinating implications for us and for practical application as well. Um, so we could spend a really long time in this epistle. You could spend, you could, you could do a whole message on every one of those illustrations. But we're going to look at Jude in one sitting. And I really believe that that is the way that this book was intended to be read. So, so let's begin. There's something about the spoken word. Um, it just takes on a new life when you really stop and meditate on these things and you kind of get the inflections that the author was intending. In Jude chapter 1, excuse me, verse 1, we read Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So here Jude introduces himself as James's brother. Now isn't that interesting? He didn't mention anything about his physical relationship to Jesus. Jude and James were Jesus's half brothers, you see. You can read about that in Mark chapter six. Jude never even mentioned his physical relationship with Jesus. And I find that very interesting. You see, he wasn't seeking a superior position based on his physical relationship with Jesus. Instead, he called himself a servant of Jesus Christ. And isn't that interesting? You know, when you think about that, Jude and James didn't even <clears throat> believe in Jesus and who he said he was until the time of the crucifixion and the resurrection. They doubted him. They lived with him for, you know, 30 years, and they doubted him. They didn't think he was who he said he was. And then the crucifixion and the resurrection came along, and they became convinced. And they both went on to do many great things for God's kingdom. Now, the word for servant that's used there in verse 1 is the Greek word doulos, which, as we've discussed before, it means bond slave. It's a willing servant, somebody who is a, a slave by choice. And I'm sure Jude valued the fact that Jesus was his half-brother and that he grew up in the same household as Jesus. I mean, think about that. That was probably pretty tough, wouldn't you think, growing up in the same household with Jesus? Can you imagine how many times Jude and James must have heard, why can't you be more like your brother? You know? Uh, and... Of course, Jude surely valued his physical relationship to Jesus, but this new relationship with Jesus was even more valuable to him. Though the blood of the cross that saved him was more important than the blood in his veins, the, the family blood that related him to Jesus. And like Paul, Jude could say, even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, Yet now we know him thus no longer. Jude tells us that he is writing, in verse 1, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father. So, this letter is written to Christians. 
It is not an evangelistic tract. It deals with things that we believe, things that we as believers need to hear, but often don't really want to. A person is a Christian because God has called him or her. The important thing is to answer the call when it comes, just like you'd answer the phone when it rings. What does it mean to be sanctified by God the Father? It means that believers are set apart. Set apart from the world and set apart unto God. Verse 1 continues, and preserved in Jesus Christ. So Jesus, of course, is our guardian and our protector. The word preserved gives us the key to the book of Jude, which discusses apostasy. It is, it is presented nowhere else in the same way in Scripture. The concept of apostasy is frightful, but Jude is not writing just to frighten the daylights out of us. He's not writing to scare us, nor is he writing just to draw a vivid picture for our information. He's going to use the word keep several times, and that's what preserve means. It means to keep. And as we'll see, you and I are living in the times of apostasy right now. We don't know how much farther we'll go into it before the rapture happens, but we are definitely in times of apostasy. Verse 2, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Now, this isn't the same greeting that you find in most of Paul's letters, for example, which typically begin with some variation of grace and peace to you but it's substantially the same as that sort of greeting. Now, I want you to notice something, though. In Jude's mind and heart, it wasn't enough to have mercy, peace, and love added to the Christian's life. Jude looked for multiplication. I find that interesting. Verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. It seems that Jude's original intent was to write about our common salvation, celebrating God's goodness and grace. However, it took a different turn when an issue arose that he felt that he just had to address, something he needed to deal with. And in verse 3, Jude tells us what we are contending for. There is plenty of earnest contention in the world today, isn't there? But it's usually not directed toward the right things. The faith, the essential truths of the gospel that all true Christians hold in common, it's, worth, it's something that's worth contending for. Verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. False teachers had crept into the early church. We've talked about that before. They were seeking to rob and to rip off God's people. These false teachers sought to prevent their understanding and to keep them from enjoying God's blessings. One of the things that made and makes these false teachers so dangerous, because they're still with us today, is that they're often unnoticed. It seems like nobody notices just how dangerous they are. They don't wear a danger false teacher name tag. They probably claimed and claim to be more biblical than anybody else. You've heard that before. These false teachers have a destiny, though. It's the destiny of every false teacher and false leader. They're marked and they are destined for condemnation. They're ungodly. They are not like God. No matter how they might outwardly appear, they disregard God. Men don't notice them, but God does. The Lord is not wringing his hands in heaven, worrying about those who deceive others through their teaching and their lifestyles. They may be hidden to some believers, but as far as God is concerned, their condemnation was marked out long ago. Their judgment is assured. We don't know how they deny God, perhaps with ungodly living, 
perhaps with heretical doctrines, maybe a little of both. But verse 5 begins, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this. So when we get to verse 21, we will find the foundational verse for this epistle. This is an exhortation for us to keep ourselves in the love of God. And if you are so inclined, I think you should underline that phrase in your Bible, keep yourselves in the love of God. It's a, the hinge upon which the book of Jude swings. Jude tells us, yes, there are heretics and there are deceivers, but you, beloved, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keeping yourself in God's love does not mean earning his love by being a good little boy or girl. God's love is unconditional. He has given his word on that. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul declares that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When did God demonstrate his love for you and for me? It wasn't when we were trying to be good Christians. It was when we were pagans, we were heathens, we were rebels. When you couldn't have cared less about him, God looked at you and said, I love you deeply. Don't ever buy into the thinking that you can earn God's love by being good. Many Christians look at God as though he's some sort of a cosmic Santa Claus. <clears throat> he's making a list, checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty and nice. If you've been good, you'll get gifts. If you haven't been so good, you'll be lucky to get a lump of coal. But nothing could be further from the truth of our Father's nature. Mm -hmm. Do you think he's making the list and checking it twice? Paul tells us that the list of our failings was blotted out by the blood of Christ. The list of your sins and mine was pinned to Calvary's cross. It was cleansed so thoroughly by the Lamb's blood that the writing became completely illegible. God's love for us is not based upon anything that we do or don't do, for his love is unconditional. What then does it mean to keep yourselves in the love of God? It means to keep yourself in the place where you can receive his blessings. God is constantly showering us with blessings. Love, grace, and many others. He's not saying, hmm, you've been kind of bad today. I'm, I'm turning this bigot off for you. No, God's blessings are always coming down. They're new every morning, as the book of Lamentations tells us. You ask, well, why am I not being blessed? Simple. You're not under the spell where the blessings come out. You've wandered away. God didn't close the spigot. Even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. As 2 Timothy tells us, his character and his nature never change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't base the flow of blessings in our lives based on how we're doing. We have to disabuse ourselves of that notion. The spigot is on full blast all the time. Therefore, the only thing that we have to do is to make sure we're in the place where we enjoy God's blessings, that we're standing under the spout where the blessings come out. Am I suggesting that it's possible for a person to remove himself or herself from the place of God's blessings? Yes. And now Jude is going to give us three examples of people who, just, who did just that. Verse 5 continues, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So Jude first brings to remembrance the people God delivered. I mean, you know this story. We've heard it before, but let's recap it. The Israelites were in bondage for how long? 400 years. That's a long time. They cried out to the Lord, who raised up Moses as a deliverer for them. And God worked mightily through Moses. After God smote Egypt with 10 plagues, the Egyptians finally got the message and released the Israelites. 
the Israelites made it to the Red Sea, where God not only parted the water for them so that they could pass through it, but he also unleashed the same water as a weapon against their enemies. And then what happened? They came to the border of Kadesh Barnea, and they sent 12 spies to scope out the land. And upon their return, the spies said, wow, it's beautiful. It's prolific. It's productive. It's perfect. There's just one problem. Tens of thousands of Anakim, giants, Shaquille O'Neal's, <laughs> occupy the land. We're nothing but grasshoppers in their sight. We're sure to be squished. Now, two of those 12 spies, and as we know, that was Joshua and Caleb, they took exception to that. They said, hey, we might be grasshoppers in their sight, but they're grasshoppers in God's sight. Therefore, they pose no problem. They'll be bread for us. We can eat them up. <coughs> Sadly, the people chose to listen to the other 10 spies and not to Joshua and Caleb. Their choice led God to say, okay, because you don't believe what I intended to do for you, you're going to have to take a few laps around Mount Sinai. You remember that from PE when you would do something stupid and the coach would make you take some laps? To... So you're going to have to take a few laps around Mount Sinai. You're going to have to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until a new generation is raised up. They spent 40 years traveling a distance of a few miles. Isn't that remarkable? Because God's people, who he delivered, did not keep themselves in the assurance of his love and his provision, they ended up dying in the desert. The only two who didn't were Caleb and Joshua. Verse 6, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So not only can those who were delivered by God fail to keep themselves in his love, but so can those who are worshipers of God. Lucifer was the worship leader in heaven. He is referred to as the anointed cherub in Ezekiel chapter 28. He had a voice like a pipe organ hands like tambourines. He wasn't just a worship leader. He was a full-on orchestra. Until the day he said, I will be like God, and he launched a rebellion. You gotta wonder, how could it have gotten to that stage? He saw God. He looked at him. He knew him. He knew who he was. He knew what he was capable of. He knew what God had accomplished. And still he said, I will be like him, and launched a rebellion. And what's even more amazing is that a third of the angels followed him. The worshipers of God in heaven became demons in hell because they did not keep themselves in the love of God. And it could happen to anyone by their own choice. Verse 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance or the punishment of eternal fire. So this is the third example of those who did not enter into God's full blessings because of unbelief. You remember how God sent fire and brimstone to destroy these cities of the plains. They were in a fertile, well-watered valley they developed an agricultural surplus in this Jordan Valley because it was so rich, so verdant, so productive. Ezekiel chapter 16 tells us that in Sodom they had an abundance of food and idleness of time. That's a bad combination, by the way. It was a productive area. They didn't have to you know, work so hard to produce the food that they needed. Instead of developing a beneficial social structure, they followed after the flesh in their idleness of time. Homosexuality became very prominent, and here Jude refers to it as strange flesh. They used their idleness of time and their abundance of bread for corrupt purposes. As a result, they, just, they suffered destruction of fire and brimstone. That was sent by God. 
That's what Jude means when he refers to this vengeance, this punishment of eternal fire. Now Jude is going to describe some of the characteristics of these false teachers. Jude verse 8. Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries, which is probably more accurately translated glorious ones, or literally glories. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending or arguing with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, and these things they corrupt themselves. So this passage offers us a, a very interesting insight. In fact, this is the only place in the Bible where we're going to find it. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 34 tells us that God buried Moses. Moses went off from the camp and died. God buried him. They never found his grave. They never found his body. That was by design. The Lord buried him. He died somewhere in the territory of Moab, Mount Nebo. He was able to look over into the promised land and see it, but he wasn't able to go over. And the Lord buried Moses. Most likely, Michael the archangel was the instrument that God used to bury him. God said, Michael, go down and bury him. Satan met him there and began to dispute with him over Moses' body. We don't know why. Even Michael, though, would not make a railing accusation against the devil. He didn't call him names. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. There are people out there who are always reviling the devil, railing on the devil, and I don't understand why. I don't personally want a confrontation with the devil. In fact, I always want the Lord between me and him. I only want to deal with him through the Lord. The Lord rebuke you, that's fine. I wouldn't say, I rebuke you, Satan. Who am I to rebuke him? He'd say, who are you? Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? The Lord rebuke you, that's fine. I can handle that. Even one of the greatest angels in heaven did not make reviling accusations against Satan. He simply said, the Lord rebuke you. These dreamers, these false teachers to whom Jude referred, they were perverting the truth within the truth. They were speaking evil of the church leadership, of the apostles, and often they would run Paul down. Oh, he's not a real apostle. Paul's just a renegade. Things like that. Well, he was anointed of God, and he was doing such great works as we know. These false teachers try to raise their own stock by running down someone that God is using. It happens all the time. They think it makes them look better if they can find flaws in somebody else. People used to take pot shots at Billy Graham all the time. They found fault with him. They judged him. Somebody once said, you're never going to gain ground by throwing mud. But so many try to do just that. They reject authority and they speak evil against dignitaries. Well, often they don't even know the things or the people about whom they are speaking such evil. Ignorance makes their evil speech even worse. The false teachers to whom Jude referred pretended to be spiritual, but their only knowledge was really natural. Root beasts can be instructively, instinctively smart, clever, but they don't have spiritual knowledge. It was the same way with false teachers about whom Jude was writing. Now that Jude has given us three examples, he's going to go on to provide three explanations. Verse 11 begins, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. The first explanation for why people no longer experience God's love in their lives is that they've gone the way of Cain. The way of Cain is anger. Cain was angry with his brother Abel because God blessed him, but he didn't bless Cain. Cain probably thought, you know what? It's not fair. It's just not fair. We both offered sacrifices to Abel. There to God. Abel brought a lamb, and I brought the fruit of my labor from the garden. God blessed my brother's offering and not mine. 
Such anger took root in Cain's heart that he killed his brother. If you're angry with your spouse, if you're bitter toward your boss, if you're unforgiving of your brother, you've gone the way of Cain. Watch out for anger. It'll pull you away from the place where you can just enjoy God's love. It'll draw you away from the spout where the blessings come out. Verse 11 continues, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit. So Jude draw our attention to Cain's anger, and now he draws it to Balaam's greed. You know Balaam's story. The three million children of Israel were on their way to the promised land. This caused Balak, the king of the Moabites, to freak out a little bit. He said, wow, that's a pretty big horde of people coming our way. If we don't do something, we're going to get trampled. Balak knew of a prophet in the area, and his name, of course, was Balaam. So Balak sent messengers to Balaam, asking him to curse the approaching Israelites. Balaam told the messengers, wait here. I must speak to the Lord about this. But even before he asked, God told him not to curse the Israelites. So the messengers returned to Balak, and told him that Balaam would not join them. Balak decided to up the ante a little bit. He sent some VIPs to Balaam. They arrived in their Mercedes chariots and their designer clothes, and they told him, come with us and you'll be blessed. Balaam replied, listen guys, even if you offered me a house full of silver and gold, hint, hint, I wouldn't go with you. Once again, the messengers returned to Balak empty-handed. They went to Balaam a third time, and this time they offered him a portion of gold in honor. For the third time, Balaam said he would seek the Lord. This time, God gave him permission to go, so he went. While he was on his way, an angel appeared to his donkey. The donkey crashed into a wall, smashing Balaam's foot in the process. Balaam began to beat his donkey, and he cried, You dumb donkey, you crushed my foot. The donkey asked Balaam, Why are you beating me? Haven't I been a good donkey all these years? I've never given you any problems. Don't you see there's an angel standing right here, preventing me from taking you where you ought not to go? Yet not even a talking donkey could deter Balaam. So he continued on his journey. At last, he reached the mountain overlooking the Israelite camp. He opened his mouth to curse them, but all that came out was blessing. Balak said, hey, I hired you to curse them, not to bless them. Maybe we should change locations. So they built another altar in a different location. And once more, Balaam stood to curse. Once more, only blessings came from his lips. The error of Balaam lay in the fact that he didn't understand God's grace. Balaam thought that because God's people were rebellious and evil, God would surely want to destroy them. Balaam knew that he couldn't curse the Israelites, but he also knew that the Israelites could bring a curse upon themselves. Balaam told Balak to have the Moabite women parade themselves in front of the Jewish men. He knew that during the romantic interludes that would be sure to follow, the Moabite women would be able to in introduce the Israelite men to their idols. Balaam was right. In the book of Numbers, we read that the people ate and bowed down to their gods. God's anger was kindled against Israel, and 24,000 people died as a result. How is it that Balaam, who spoke some of the most beautiful prophecies in all of the Old Testament about the coming of Messiah, how is it that he ended up a heretic and a loser? because he did not keep himself in God's love. Why didn't he keep himself in God's love? Greed. What is greed? It's never being satisfied, never being thankful, always wanting just a little more. Watch out. Greed will remove you from the spout where the blessings come out. Verse 11 concludes, And perished in the rebellion of Korah. Cain's sin was anger, Balaam's sin was greed. Korah's sin was envy. We find his story in Numbers chapter 16. 
He said, hey, Moses, who made you the big kahuna? I have just as much right to determine this nation's direction as you do. And Korah led a rebellion, resulting in the deaths of nearly 15,000 of God's people. What is the lesson for us? It's to rest in the place that God has for us. He'll put you right where you should be. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't want to be all that the Lord would have us to be. But there comes a point when we're no longer saying, Lord, I want you to develop the talents and abilities you've given me to the fullest degree. But rather, I've got to do whatever it takes to gain that guy's position. Do you remember what happened to Korah? The ground opened up and sucked him in. Here's an easy way to find yourself in the pit. Be envious of another person's position. You don't know what you're headed for. You don't see what you're getting into. And before you know it, your world will come crashing down upon you. Through Jude, the Lord tells you and me, anger, greed, and envy are three specific areas that will keep you from enjoying and experiencing my love. Verse 12, these are spots or stains in your love feasts. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So early Christians often met for a common meal. It was something like a, a potluck dinner. They called these meals love feasts or agape feasts. And when these certain men came, they were serving only themselves. They ate greedily while others went hungry. And at these agape feasts, everyone brought what they could. Some brought a little, some a lot, but they all shared it together. Some of these Christians were slaves. And these agape feasts might have been the only decent meal that they got on a regular basis. The selfishness of these certain men spoiled the fellowship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 describes a similar problem in the Corinthian church. It spoils fellowship when we come to church with a selfish bless me attitude. We find some interesting analogies in verses 12 and 13. Clouds without water aren't really good for anything. They don't, really, you know, they don't bring any life-giving rain. And they block out the sun. We could use a little rain right now, right? But these waterless clouds, they exist for themselves. And these certain men were like these clouds. They were carried about by the winds, floating on the breeze from one fad to another. They're also likened to late autumn trees without fruit. Now, by late autumn, trees should be bearing fruit. These certain men didn't bear fruit even when they should. They only take instead of giving. Here's another analogy. They're like raging waves of the sea. For us, the sea is often a thing of beauty, right? Isn't it great to go down to the shore and to just watch the waves roll in? But to ancient man, especially in biblical cultures, the sea was a terror. These certain men were busy. They were active like the raging waves of the sea, but they were only foaming up their own shame. Their fruit, quote unquote, was like the foam or the scum at the seashore. It was nothing of substance. Like comets streaking through the sky, these certain men astonished the world for a time. And then they vanished into darkness. An unpredictable star wasn't helpful for guidance or for navigation. Even so, these deceivers were useless and untrustworthy. Their destiny was blackness of darkness forever. Unless they repent, they'd end up in hell and be there forever. The punishment of hell is forever because a mere man is paying for his own sins. If offering an imperfect sacrifice, which must be repeated over and over and over again for eternity. A perfect person however, can offer a single sacrifice. An imperfect person must continually offer a sacrifice. Now, our obligations to God are infinite. They can only be satisfied in Jesus Christ, the infinite one. Jude, verse 14. Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, 
prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. So here Jude quoted from Enoch, who was described in Genesis chapter 5 and mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Now the ancient book of Enoch was not received as scripture, but it was highly respected among both the Jews and early Christians. Jude did not quote from Enoch to tell us anything new, but rather to give us a vivid description of what the Bible already teaches. The Apostle Paul also quoted non-biblical sources on at least three occasions, in the book of Acts, the book of 1 Corinthians, and Titus. This wasn't just to proclaim a new truth, but it was to support an already established biblical principle. God is coming to judge the ungodly, all of the ungodly. Many people take God's judgment lightly, but the most important question in the world is, will God judge me? Am I accountable to him? If we're truly accountable to God, we're fools if we don't prepare to face that judgment. Now, these people sound kind of like politicians to me, flattering people to gain advantage. You know, every time an election is rolling around, they care about what you think, supposedly. And then after the election passes, who are you? I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah, they just flatter people to gain advantage. It's just the, the politicking of man, you know? It's terrible. Verse 17. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. This probably refers to Peter. Remember, he told us that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That's from 2 Peter chapter 3. Jude, verse 19. These are sensual or worldly persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. You see, our faith should be increasing. It should be growing. The longer you walk with the Lord, the greater your faith should be. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What's the advantage of coming to Bible study every week? Your faith is growing because you're learning about God. We're simply going through God's word. As we go through it, what we read will be an advantage to you. It will be a benefit. Just reading and hearing God's word will build your faith. You'll begin to understand more and more about God. The more you understand him, the more you'll trust him. You're building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit to direct your prayer, sometimes groaning in the Spirit because of situations for which you just can't find the words. Or if you have the gift, maybe praying in an unknown tongue. Verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Finally, we are to keep ourselves in the love of God by looking for Jesus' coming. It will affect my priorities. It will change my perspective. It will alter my emotions when I say, Lord, today I'm going to look for your coming. Today could be the day. What a difference it makes when we remember this. Stay in the word. Pray in the spirit. Look for Jesus coming. Amen. There you have three things you can do to keep yourself under the spout where the blessings come out. They're practical. They're workable. They're doable. And interestingly, we see in them faith, hope, hope. And love. Faith by being in the Word. Love by praying in the Spirit, whose fruit is love. And hope by looking for the blessed hope of our Lord's return. Now, some people charge, oh, you guys at Calvary Chapel, all you ever talk about is being in the Word, looking for His coming, and praying. And to that I reply, right? Amen. Exactly. You got it. That's exactly what Jude tells us to do. 
in order to keep ourselves in God's love. Jude verse 22, and on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. That's a tough verse. What about those who have been affected by false teachers or caught up in wrong doctrine? What are we to do with them? Jude gives us two approaches that we can take. To some, show compassion. Be very gentle with them as you patiently wait for them to see the light. Others, however, you have to grab by the nape of the neck and yank them out of the destructive stuff into which they've become involved. <clears throat> you might remember the Great Awakening that took place in America, and it was ushered in by Jonathan Edwards, among others. Now, Jonathan Edwards spoke in a monotone voice. He had such bad eyesight that he could only occasionally squint at his congregation from above the manuscript that he held inches from his face. He preached a sermon that some have studied in literature class. It was entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, in which Edwards likened mankind to a spider dangling over a fire with only one thread separating it from damnation. When he was finished, people began to weep under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now you can't witness to everyone in the same way. People are different. People have different temperaments. People will respond to different things. You can minister to some people with compassion, stressing God's goodness. For doesn't Paul say in Romans chapter two, verse four, that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance? Others, however, you have to grab by the collar and like Jonathan Edwards, dangled him over hell. You literally have to scare the hell out of them. May the Lord ever give us discernment to know which approach to employ in each case. Verse 23 concludes, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. In the Old Testament, whenever a person was cleansed from leprosy, which as we know is a picture of sin, their garments were to be burned, as Leviticus chapter 13 tells us. Jude uses this as an analogy to say when you're dealing with folks who are caught up in perversity, make sure that you yourself are not affected. In other words, save the person but burn the garment. And now Jude is going to give us a beautiful benediction. Verse 24, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That's exactly how the Lord is going to present you and me faultless before the presence of his glory. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus bore the sins of the world. Every sin you have ever committed or will ever commit, Jesus died for them. They're all covered by the blood. Now, we don't take God's grace and use it as a cloak for lasciviousness. He who practices habitual sin really doesn't know God. Thank God for those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ and seek to walk in him. We may stumble, we may fall, but he's going to present us faultless when he presents us to the Father. <coughs> Verse 25, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever, amen. After all of his warnings, Jude leaves us in a place of rest. God's love is unconditional. It's never turned off. It's never diminished. The only question is, will you plant yourself in a place where you can be drenched with it? Jude tells us exactly how to do that as he exhorts us to stay in the word, to pray in the spirit, and to look for our Lord's coming. Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you, if you do them, God's word is simple. May the Lord build your faith as you study it. May he fill you with love as you pray in the spirit. And may he give you hope as you look for his coming in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for the assurance we have, the hope that we have, 
the rest that we can find in the fact that despite our best efforts, you will present us faultless before the Father. Your grace is greater than all of our sin. Oh, how compassionate, how merciful and gracious you are, how desperately we need you, how blessed we are to have you. And this has been your plan from the very beginning, Lord. You knew before the foundation of the world, you knew before Adam ever drew his first, first breath how this was all going to turn out. You are ageless, you are timeless. And we love you. We cast our cares on you now. And we ask you, Lord, to give us an eternal perspective and help us to keep ourselves in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, isn't Jude a great book? Uh -huh. yes. Man, it's so powerful and so short. Well, I'm going to focus on one word today. It isn't used very much anymore. And I want to look at the fruit of the Spirit. Does anybody know where that is? Galatians 5, 22. Okay, good place to highlight in your word. And I want to go through the, um, the fruit. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And what's the next word in uh, verse 23? Gentleness. Gentleness. And self-control. There is no law against these things. I want to focus on that first word uh, in verse 23. The only translation I could find that has a different word is the King James. And I don't really honestly read the word the King James very much anymore. Like you, I read the New King James or the NAS or the New Living Translation. And you know what the word is translated in the King James there, that word? Meekness. Remember that word? Yes. We used to talk about it all the time, meekness. And it addresses many of the problems that were highlighted by Pastor Sean in the book of Jude. Envy and anger and greed and ego, egotistical um, behavior. So I want to read through some um, notes I took about, uh, about meek, meekness uh, that I shared with the men yesterday in the men's study. Um, meekness is a lack of self-pride or self-concern. <clears throat> now think about that. It's easy to say that, but God wants us to go through life not focused on ourselves. Is that one of our major problems in our world today? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I think it is. Thinking about yourself all the time. How you're triggering me, or mm. you're not respecting me, mm. or... I demand this or I demand that. That's a huge problem in our world. People are not meek anymore. <clears throat> it's a strength of disciplined calmness. The strength of disciplined calmness. That's hard. When people are against you or they criticize you or things are happening that you don't like, God wants you to be disciplined and calm and do that in a strong way. So meekness is not uh, a doormat. Meekness is not uh, never having an opinion, never speaking your mind, or just doing what everybody else says. Not at all. It's also benevolent compass compassion for others. Wanting the best for others. Don't see much of that going on in the world today. So you see we have a great opportunity as Christians to be the light that God wants us to be and the love that God wants us to be. Someone who is afflicted carrying a heavy burden but willing to endure it rather than succumb to it. So no whining. 
No, no complaining. Life's too hard for me. No. Meekness is with the power of God, you carry the burden. It's not timid, it's not being run over, but it's a powerful demonstration of strength. Moses exhibited it in leading the nation of Israel out of, out of Egypt, through the wilderness, and finally to the edge of the promised land. And God wants us to demonstrate it. A firm resolve, courage, conviction, and strength Speak out against immoral behavior and wickedness. Deny ourselves and act on behalf of others. Surrender to God, not people. And submit to God, not evil or sin. Okay, so meekness is a powerful word. It's a great virtue to have. That's why it's in the fruit of the Spirit. So when you read that gentleness in your translation, occasionally go back to the King James and think of meekness and all that is. Because it's more than gentleness. Gentleness kind of describes somebody who's just nice all the time. Okay, and sometimes meekness demands that we not exactly be nice. We speak up. We say what's right. And this world needs that a lot. Okay, who's doing the worship? <laughs> Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> So 
Lord, as we uh, celebrate communion together, we remember your sacrifice. You exhibited meekness in many different situations. You were strong when you needed to be. You were patient. You always looked to the Father to do what he wanted you to do and not what you wanted to do. Help us to be more like that, Lord. So we, um, we take this bread in remembrance, Lord, that you sacrificed your body willingly in obedience to your Father, to our Father. That you could take upon yourself all the sins of the world. We take of the bread. And this juice, Lord, represents your blood that was spilled for us. It's the cleansing agent that you prescribed to the nation of Israel for generations. That without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. You were prepping them, foreshadowing for them, your blood that would be shed for our sin and the sin of the whole world. We thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood for us. God bless you and thank you to all the fathers who put in so many hours raising their kids. And to those of you that may not have kids, but you still mentor kids, or you're an uncle, or a friend, or something. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, oh Spirit, come make us humble. Turn our eyes from evil things, oh Lord, cast down. desperate need and he has a work for us to do so now let's go out there and do it shall we the Lord bless thee the Lord bless thee and keep thee and keep thee the Lord make his face to shine
shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his countenance, his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace. May God richly bless you.